guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6. Shalom to everybody. My name is Al, and I will be your guide today on our topic, Bereshit Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, Israel's time capsule to the moon? Well, not exactly to the moon, but to the amazing Hebraic word called Bereshit, which most of you know as Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. I'd like to first dedicate this video to Mazel and Mikal, Ricky and Yuda, and all my friends in Herzliya, Israel. I'd like to say first that uh, you rabbis have really lost a lot of love and feeling for this word Bereshit, and you're keeping all the information to yourself and not sharing with the rest of us. Thereby, this is why we made this video to share the amazing significance of the very word Bereshi with the people, including my Israeli friends. Our word for consideration is Bereshi. There's an accent over the B. It's kind of a B, B sound, Bereshi. This is the modern Hebrew today, but most of you know this as Genesis. However, Genesis tells you right off the bat that it's really a Greek word, and on our timeline, we'll put it down here somewhere around 800 BCE, before the Common Era, the Greek culture will inherit from the Hebraic Phoenicians their script. But instead of carrying it over with the fullness of the script, they will streamline it and make the A, A, and the B, Ba, and the D, Da. That's our phonetics. And as we move down the timeline here, the Romans will follow the Greeks with their script. And then finally, the barbarians in the form of the Germanic peoples who, of course, love to go to England, and time they get there, we will get a amalgamation of all this, and that's what we say today, even though we don't read Greek, but we speak English. But where did Bereshit come from? What does it say? In the beginning. That's way down here. So with that said, follow us as we track this amazing word, Bereshit, what was lost in the time capsule. We are now looking at the original script of the word Bereshi, in the beginning. Now, let's, for an example, take this letter right here, and we write it like this, and it's actually an ox, an ox's head an ox's head or a bull. Well, as this comes from the Middle East, everybody knows that they, are, they have no elephants, they have no tigers, they have no bears, oh my. So the strongest beast in that part of the world necessarily would be a bull and thereby it would be the strongest. And as the strongest, it would also carry the meaning of being first. And then finally, if you were to go to New York City, to one of my favorite places, the Metropolitan Museum, and on the second level in the Near East exhibit, they have 10 foot tall bull men. Yes, it sounds a little funny, but these were their leaders because a leader would be the strongest and first, would he not? Okay, 
So we're starting to see that these characters carry a lot of meaning with them besides simply being the A, Be'era. Thereby, we're starting to see that if we were to take this figure and rotate it, we would actually get our A. And that's the beginning of the Aleph Beit, or what we would later call in the Greek period, over here, we would call that the alphabet. So, welcome to the world of Paleo Hebraic pictographs. Because as a picture is worth a thousand words, here a letter is worth a lot more than just the A sound. So to find the fullness of what this word is really about and the depth of it, follow us as we continue to the next letter. Our next character for consideration is the first character, and we draw it like this. And what is this? It's actually a living space. People would enter through here, and this would be the primary room where they'd sleep and cook, much like your house. Indeed, in Hebrew, it actually carries the definition of house as well as in. And when we put these two letters together, the A and the B, it actually spells something. But before I tell you what that is, let me demonstrate something. The Big Bang. You've all been lied to about that, that that was in the beginning, and that's how you got here. And they've been telling you that you came from monkeys, and thereby you must be animals. And remember this, if you are an animal, you'll be treated as such. However, if we were to take this A and this B and put them together, we spell our very first word. And that word in Hebrew is father. And if we follow through with in the beginning, what does it say? It says God created. God created. And who is God? Strongest, first, leader, more than leader. He's God. And this house, does God live in a house made out of tar, sheetrock, and plastic? No. His house is the creation, where you come from. Bigger than time, bigger than the universe, and it's all on your cell phones, and your pastor has forgot to tell you that. Our next letter for consideration is the R sound, in Hebrew, pronounced resh, and we have this character looking like this. And the question is, what kind of meanings would this carry with it? Well, we can see that it's the R, and it has a little head on it. And matter of fact, it is the head of something, or the sum of something. And who knows all about this to begin with? Who teaches the Israelis and the Jewish people about Genesis, Bereshit, the Torah? What's the Bible all about? But we take this and we put it next to this character, the A, and it actually spells Rob, pronounced Rob, which is short for rabbi. And what would the rabbis teach us? But they would teach us about Abraham. Remember, A.B., the father, the father of many nations. 
and then he would have a son called Isaac who would carry on the knowledge, the information about God to his son, Jacob. And Jacob would have 12 sons and form what we would call Israel. And who were these people? These people were sons of God. They were sons of God. Thereby, this very symbol in the father's house also has to be a son. And who would this be? The son of God. Now, I know a lot of you may not like this, but this is what the word is all about, and it is telling us. And six in stones, and if you don't like this, you can take a... And what any son does in a house is to carry on the very name of that house through the name of the Father. Our next letter for consideration is the Shin, the 21st letter in the Hebrew Aleph Beit. And it looks like this. And the question is, what is this? And the answer is, it's teeth. It's teeth. Teeth. And what do teeth do but to tear, rip, devour. To best understand this, we now have to go to Bereshit 3.1 or Genesis 3.1, and it says this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And if we were to take the word serpent in Hebrew, it's actually pronounced nakash, but spelled in the Hebrew like this, with the, I think it's the 12th letter, and it is a little spermocyte, and it is the N for nakash, and what do you think that possibly could carry with it, but action? and life. Now we go to the eighth letter in the Hebrew, Aleph Bet, and we don't have this in English, it's called a Chet. It's kind of a middle throat guttural sound, Chet. And it's actually a fence. And what does a fence do? But it is a wall and it divides. It surrounds something. And then finally, we have our shin, the 21st letter, the teeth. And when we put this together in the pictograph, what does it mean? It means that the teeth devour the wall of life. That's what a serpent does. Thereby, when we take a look at the Verse in Genesis 3.1, again, it says, Now the serpent, the Nakash, was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God has made. That's the English, but in the Hebrew, the word for God is Elohim, translated in English as the Almighty, and it is singular to fact. Again, Bereshit 3.1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. To better understand this, we need to go to Bereshit 1.2. And there we will read, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Almighty moved upon the face of the waters. The Almighty is spirit. And when we look at chapter 1, verse 27, it says, 
And so the Almighty created man in his image. In the image of the Almighty created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, so we're starting to see that this serpent wasn't just any beast of the field, but he is a lot more than that. And to better understand this, open your Bibles to Ezekiel 28. Okay, turning your scriptures to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. Ezekiel, and thou hast been in Eden, the garden of the Almighty. Ooh. Every precious stone was thy covering, sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of the tabarets and pipes were prepared for thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so of the Almighty. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created until sin was found in you. Now we open to the book of Yeshiahu or Isaiah chapter 14 and it reads in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? You Christians know what we're talking about here. In the Hebrew, it's called Ben Shakal or Shakar, and it means O Day Star, the Son of the Morning. How art thou cast down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the Almighty. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, the sides of the pit, Gehenim. Continuing with the exposure of the serpent, this is particularly for you, my Israeli friends. Turn to Dibri HaYamin Aleph, or in English, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, and it reads, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. This will cause Israel to sin. Why? Because they didn't rely upon the Father for everything. And they will pay a very heavy price. Indeed, 70,000 of you will fall because of David's sin in numbering Israel. However, to understand the fullness of this, we have to take a look at this word Satan, because it is very much in the Torah, only the rabbis aren't teaching it. And it looks like this. We take our shin that we've seen before, the teeth. We take this letter, which you haven't seen yet, uh, I believe it's the ninth letter, it's called Tet, and it carries with it the meaning of snake and to surround, to surround. And then we have our spermocyte, which you saw before, which is about life and action. And when we put it together, Satan, and what does the do? But the teeth surround and devour life, exactly what Satan does. Now, so we see that he is indeed the serpent, which was where? Way down here at the beginning, in Bereshit. And when we open to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 1, Yeshua, Jesus, tells us, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, 
which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So what we're seeing in all of this is you do very much so have an enemy. And soon we're going to find out what he does. This is not a yin and yang thing, good and evil. You do good and you get good. You do bad and you get bad. No, no, no. That's not how it works. You're going to start to see how the enemy works. And at this phase of the game, he is very much focusing in on Israel. Okay, in summary, what we're looking at here, the B carries the meaning of house, but more than house, the creation. The Resh is the son of who created everything, the father. The father who is God, more than that, he's the creator. So this is the son of God. And then these are teeth. Who's got the teeth? Yes. We're starting to see that the enemy who was created, the covering guardian cherub, who was in the beginning, isn't a serpent, but indeed, he's very much in the beginning as well. He's a created being, like the Father, who is spirit, like his Son, thereby the enemy is spirit as well. To better understand this, let's go back to Bereshit chapter 3, that's Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Father Almighty had made. And he said to the woman, Ye, has the Almighty said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the Almighty has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, the Father gave them that commandment. Indeed, that's their only commandment. However, he certainly didn't say, don't touch it. They were gardeners. They had to touch it. Okay, uh, and the serpent said unto the woman, You shall surely not die. You surely shall not die. And the Almighty does know that in the day thereof that your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods as Elohim. Some of you might think that. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired, to make one wise. And thereby she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her and he did eat of Kovish. Of course they eat. How many times have you been tempted? and given in. Okay, we pick it up in verse 13. And the Almighty was walking through the garden, and he said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. He deceived me. And the Father Almighty said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field, and upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thou shalt eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, that's hatred, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is actually the second biblical prophecy in the whole scriptures. Guess what the first is? That's the first. Now it's being worked out in the second. Okay, so they eat of the tree of knowledge. They are expelled from the garden. And they live to be 930 years old. So how did they die 
that same day. Well, if you open to 2 Peter chapter 3, he got this revelation. By the way, rabbis, you should know that the revelation doesn't start at the beginning. It's all throughout the scriptures, even though it's all in the very first word. Truly, you can know the end from the beginning, if you know this. Peter tells us that, know this, brethren, that one day with the Almighty is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, thereby the very day that the two ate of the tree of knowledge, they died that same day, even though it was 930 years later. But this prophecy continues, and the prophecy is what? That a woman shall have a seed which shall grow up and crush the head of the serpent, the enemy, Satan. So that is the Father's original intentions, to clean out his house, the creation, from this serpent. As we go down the timeline, we will find little houses. The first one is going to be Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, and they're going to have a son called Cain. He's the first son. And then they're going to have a second son called Abel. But what is going to take place is the first son is going to kill the second son and then be banished. So what has taken place? There's no seed of either one of them to grow up to crush the head of the enemy. Satan wins first round. But the father comes back with Adam and Eve in chapter 5, and they have another son. His name is called Seth. We get rid of the H, that's not the Hebrew, but it's spelled like this. Here's our teeth, and this is a sign we haven't seen. It's the last letter in Bereshit, last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it carries with it the idea of covenant, mark, or sign. And what does it say? It says that the devouring sign crushes all. Thereby, this is a sign that is continuing the line as we move forward. We're going to get into other houses along the way, but what you're going to start to see, because he is very much not a serpent, but a spirit, he gets into these houses. Remember, he tempted David to number Israel, and the Israelis paid heavily for this. This is the circumstances that we're all going to find ourselves in. But in order for the first prophecy to be fulfilled, we have to go back to the next letter. Let's go. Our next man for consideration after Seth is going to be Noah. But in the Hebrew, his name is actually spelled with our little spermacyte, the N. And we saw this letter before. Uh, it was the eighth letter. It was the Chet. And that was a fence. A fence or a wall. And Noah, of course, will go on to build his boat, his ark, which was a wooden box. That's what it means in Hebrew. Ark means box. And his name is actually the key to this because what does it say? It says a wall of life. So the ark is actually a wooden box 
that or of life. It carries life. It carries tomorrow's hope. And tomorrow's hope for Noah, he's going to have three sons. And out of those three sons, one of them is called Shem. And in Hebrew, that means name. Because we're going to start to find out that after Set, the name of the father starts to be lost. And Shem is going to be a characteristic of getting that name back. As we progress down the timeline, the next little house to come to would have to be Abraham's house. Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Now these two had a problem, and that was Sarah could never get pregnant. She could never somehow have a child. So she, in her own worldly wisdom, says to Abraham, why don't you take my uh, Egyptian servant and have a child by her? So he does this, and the child born is Ishmael, and he's the son. Uh, the father comes along, likes Abraham, and says, look, I know you're an old man and your wife is almost as old as you are, but guess what? She's going to have a son this time next year. And Sarah, being nine years old, what would she do but laugh? Thereby, that becomes the very name of the child. He who laughs, Isaac, to be born, the child of promise. But what is this child doing? Everybody is carrying on the hope of the seed, the seed of the woman. So Isaac will go on to have Jacob and Esau. Again, we see the divided house, just like Cain and Abel. Esau, kind of like a lot of you, my friends, uh, isn't so keen on keeping his birthright, and he sells it to Jacob for a meal. Jacob's name just happens to be supplanter, so the blessing will fall from the father of Isaac instead of Esau, the firstborn, to Jacob, the secondborn. And it's in this respect that it is a shadow picture of what will be taking place all the way down the line. The enemy is getting in these houses and trying to disrupt the second prophecy, the seed of the woman, which he knows someday will grow up and crush his head. So it's in this respect that Jacob will go on to continue his household, and he will have 12 sons. But those 12 sons are not necessarily happy campers, and it will become a what kind of house? A divided house it will become ten brothers versus one this being Joseph Joseph and what will they do to their own brother but sell him to get him out of the picture so he's out of the picture he's gone he's in Egypt Mitzrayim the chaos between the waters so he is moving down to Egypt, as we shall see. Continuing with our story, Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt. Although he has his ventures uh, and hardships, he rises to the top of the pyramid, slowly, 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 to becomes a very powerful man. Meanwhile, back in Israel, the ten brothers and the father Jacob, who was lied to by them, that he lost his son somehow by uh, accident, maybe a wild animal ripped him to pieces and ate him. So he thinks Joseph is dead. 
But at this point, they're desperate, and Jacob tells his ten sons, go to Egypt and buy us some grain. So they do this. But as they come to Egypt, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. How could they? Look where he's sitting now. They're mere shepherds, which the Egyptians despised. So he contrives a situation where they are forced to return to Egypt, and this time he plants a golden cup, his divining cup, in their baggage as they are leaving, and then sends his guards out to search their baggage. They find it. They see that they're guilty. He brings them back to his palace, and now he is confronting them. And we pick this up in Genesis 44, verse 14. And it says, And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell on the ground before him. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that you have done? Don't you know that such a man as I surely divine? And Judah, Judah said, What shall we say, my master? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God, God the Almighty, the Father, the Father has found out our iniquity of thy servants. And behold, we are thy master's servants. So they know that from selling their brother so many years before, that in reality, this was their sin, and it was finally found out by Pharaoh. However, and of course, of Colvish, this is all what? A shadow picture of the big picture which is going to be taking place way down the timeline like this. And then came a Egyptian pharaoh that did not know Joseph. Somewhere about BC, 1550 before the Common Era, there came a pharaoh that did not know Joseph and today we would call him a maniac, but he had a policy, and that was to destroy all the Hebrew male-born children. And what do they do? They destroy the seed that can grow up someday and crush the enemy's head. That's what it's really about. So, of course, they tried to destroy all the first male born, but there is one particular child that will escape Pharaoh's wrath, and we call him in English Moses, but in Hebrew his name is Moshe. Hey, it's Moshe. And he is saved by his mother. Israeli women are very clever, and she builds a ark or a basket of bulrushes. This is his little ark that sailed him over the waters of chaos to live. And of course, he ends up, of all places, at the top of the pyramid again. Through time, he discovers who he is. That's very big for most of us realizes that where he's at isn't the place to be, and he leaves. He leaves. But through time, the father sends him back and gets his people, performs the Passover, and the Israelites get out of bondage. Israelites out. Passover. They get out. Shortly after they end up in Jordan, Aqaba, somewhere around that area, uh, Moses is instructed very specifically to build another ark. 
another wooden box. Why? To now carry the word of the Almighty. The Ark. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of Life. Okay, what we see so far from Adam to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, what is the big problem that all of these people share? And that is that they all die. Because ever since the garden, when they were kicked out, man has lost something. Do you remember we said earlier that in Bereshit 127, the Father created man in his image, which is spirit. But these people are all dying because, like the beasts of the field, they are only made, formed, and breathed. That's all they do, like a beast of the field. And when they die, their last breath is their last. That's it. Thereby, something had to be done. And it's not till we get to the new covenant where Yeshua tells us plainly in chapter 3, verse 1, there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler or a rabbi of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus, Yeshua, by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from the Almighty, for no man can do these miracles that you do except the Almighty be with him. And Yeshua answered and said up to him, I say to you that except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of the Almighty. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Remember, Joseph's brothers came to him a second time. Then they found out what was happening. And Yeshua answered, Verily I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of the Almighty. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which was born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Continuing with our bearer sheet, we now come to the 10th letter, and this is called a yud. It's actually a hand clenched at the end of a arm, a 90 degree angle. And that would carry the meaning with it of work, hand, and the final consummation of what you do for work with your hand would be a deed. You can make a mess, you can do something good, but it is all about what we do. Finishing up our word Bereshit, we finally come to the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet called the Tav, the Tav. And it carries with it the meaning of mark, sign, and amazingly, covenant. It is a covenant as well. Now, for you Christians, you should know this, that a covenant is always between two living beings. It involves blood. It involves specifics and guarantees and obligations. All of this goes together in keeping the covenant, whereas a testament is a written will of a dead man where it states, so-and-so gets my car, my bank account, my uh, golf clubs, whatever it may be. 
But a covenant always involves blood. And so we put this together. And what we see here in Bereshit is that the house, the beginning of creation, there is the Son of God. The Father is the Father of the house, the builder of the house, the creator. The serpent is in the house. He is a creative being also. But in Isaiah and Ezekiel, he rebels against the Father. He wants to be like the Most High. He wants to set his throne above the heavens. And it's in this respect that this is the work of the enemy. Satan kills the Messiah in the creation, worship through his covenant. This is the fullness of Bereshit in the beginning. And this is the Father's first biblical prophecy working itself out in the second biblical prophecy of a woman someday shall have a seed. And that seed will grow up to crush the head of the enemy, Jesus. Yeshua's wooden tab, wooden cross, covenant, the blood covenant to mankind, making sacrifice to get man back in the garden, which is paradise, to beat death, which is the author of the enemy, who kills, lies, and steals, for he is Satan, the enemy. And this is the fullness of Bereshit what was in the beginning. And it's not any silly time capsule to the moon, but indeed a time capsule to life.